what motivates us and what we hope to see happen in this area of work that we're doing over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years is that we are going to systematically bring medical knowledge and science to the problem of recovery of consciousness and recovery of cognitive function after serious brain injuries, whether that's stroke, traumatic brain injury, cardiac arrest, other, other types of non-progressive brain injury. And what we're interested in is understanding how to measure recovery of consciousness, how to identify when consciousness is improving and people are getting better, whether or not they can actually move, gesture, or speak, or tell us, and also when they can, to encourage that process and understand the mechanisms by which the recovery occurs so that we can better intervene and introduce new therapies so that patients can get better faster and so that people who might not seem like they could get considerably better might get considerably better with new therapy. So the kinds of things we're interested in are restoring functions of communication, of the ability to be independent in function how, wh at whatever level whether it's be, being able to feed yourself again or being able to stand and walk and not have to be in a skilled nursing facility. Uh, and, and the principles that we're looking at in terms of brain function, we think, will have a continuity so that once we understand this, they will apply more generally than just the most severely brain injured patients who we concentrate our efforts on. This is a very fortunate time to try to do this work as a moment in history. Over the last 10 to 15 years, a number of tools have become available to neuroscientists that allow us to go directly into the brain and make measurements. Whether that's a measurement from the outside of the brain or actually inside of the brain, we are starting to be able to put together information and ideas that wouldn't have been possible in the past because we just simply couldn't understand what was happening. We didn't have any way of measuring brain function and correlating it with behavior. Most of neurology for many, many years relied upon evidence gained after a person no longer was alive of where their brain was injured and what kind of behavior they could exhibit. Starting in the early 1990s, it became possible to use neuroimaging techniques, not just to take a picture of very similar information of where there was an injury and how somebody behaved, but actually how the brain was functioning inside the head while behaviors were being uh, carried out. We now have a wide range of tools and very sophisticated measurements, such as the equipment that you see behind me, to measure brain energy use, to look at connections of, of the brain in, in great detail, and even measure how they might change slowly over time in the adult brain. We have new concepts because many of the ideas that we take for granted today were actually disputed as uh, possibly not possible as, as early as, as little as 10, 15 years ago. We now have evidence, some of the evidence has come from inferential work we've done in our own studies, that even late in adulthood after structural brain injury, there are structural changes in the brain. Probably more important than that, and what we're really spending a lot of our focus on, is understanding the dynamic changes in the brain. The dynamic changes in the brain can be measured by tools like MRI machines, when we look at functional activity, PET machines like the machine behind me when we measure brain metabolism or very excitingly when we measure the precise action of individual neurotransmitters. In this building in the basement there's an atom splitter called a cyclotron and it has the ability to synthesize chemical compounds that could be injected into the human body where small changes in the atomic structure have been made to place a very short-acting radioactive atom. And that atom can be the, the radiation as that atom decays, goes through its radioactive decay process, can be measured by this system behind us in the PET scanner. The PET scanner is sensitive to subatomic particles and it can measure them. And it can use the measurement of those particles to create a picture of brain energy use. And that picture is local. So just like a, uh, a cardiac scan that people might be familiar with where they look at a picture of the heart and there's one part of the wall that's hot and one part of the wall that's cold and they understand that maybe the heart attack took out one part of the heart, what we can see here is individual parts of the brain and how active they are. But the other thing that can be done with this machine downstairs and with this measurement device here is that specific compounds could be made to target very precise 
receptor systems, which are the, the chemical codes that individual types of neurons use to talk to each other in very specific parts of the brain. So these are the kinds of tools that would allow uh, extremely careful measurement of what's working in a brain, when a brain might be ready to accept uh, a drug and respond to it, and to correlate that kind of measurement with these other measurements. What kind of cognitive per function does a person have at the bedside? What kind of electrical activity correlates with that? And as people get better, how does this whole system move over time? That's really the core question we're interested in. It is research, and so when people come to us to do research, we, you know, we tell them that they're, they're here to help us understand, but we're not offering a clinical service to do that. On the other hand, um, what we found is that in general, when patients come and, uh, or, and their families bring them, we often learn quite a lot about what's going on with them, and sometimes it feeds back rather, rather dramatically. Uh, one, one, one recent example is a patient we followed for three years who came to us with what we thought was a diagnosis that wouldn't change. Um, it was a woman who had had a very significant brain injury of a non-traumatic type, which we traditionally thought wouldn't improve. And we talked to her doctors after making the brain measurements and suggested some very standard things. We followed her over three years. And what we've, 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 we've been able to see a change from almost no evidence of conscious awareness and behavioral responsiveness to the first glimmers of speaking words and interacting at a, a little more than two years after this injury to very recently through the spontaneous recovery process that we've been meticulously tracking with all of these measurements. Um, she spontaneously emerged to the point where she is fluent in language. She's still not completely aware of her circumstances and her, her injury, but she's so recovered that her family has taken her back home. Her friends have invited her on a weekend getaway, and she has an enormous um, sense of humor, and she is spontaneous, and she is fully re-engaged as a human being. And I think to, for people to understand what we're really doing here, is we're really trying to learn the rules of the recovery process. But if we do, imagine a context that may be more familiar. A patient with Alzheimer's disease who has slipped just beyond the point of contact Imagine if we knew what we should do to bring them back for a year so they could continue to talk and interact with their family and smile at their grandchildren and call them by name. This is what we're seeing. We're seeing families who have watched somebody stay out of contact for two or three years regain their human connection with their family member. We're trying to understand how that process actually occurs from a medical and scientific point of view so that we can accelerate it figure out when it could happen and when it can't so that we can give hope when it's appropriate and not give hope when it's not, and be systematic about it. Approach it the way people expect an academic tertiary care center to take a problem seriously, through careful measurement, through really intelligent modeling, and through systematic effort. I think the work that has the most immediate uh, translation, it, it, and it's gonna be within the next five years, I suspect, is the, is the application of measurements to track recovery and identify recovery when it's not obvious at the bedside uh, being spread from the research context into the uh, community of clinicians who work in ICUs around the country or maybe even in community hospitals. We have, uh, along with colleagues in, in Europe and in the UK, been working on the use of imaging uh, technologies to measure residual brain function, uh, to measure the ability to respond to questions or even to try to communicate, not by speaking or moving, but by creating mental activity that can be measured through the MRI machine or through EEG. That work has, by and large, been in the research context so far. Um, we've recently reproduced results that came out this year from our colleagues in, in England showing that some patients who can't communicate and can't speak at the bedside can answer commands by generating mental imagery and at least in one case, this was shown in Europe and we've now shown it ourselves here, could attempt to communicate using this method. Th these are sort of major milestones in being able to use brain imaging tools to make these assessments, but the translation 
into the general clinical use is, is going to be a significant step. And collectively, we're all working together to try to create the database of large numbers of studies and tools that can be made available generally and freely so that other doctors can use them. I think that's going to take about five years, but the impact of that is going to be enormous because the highest risk medical error that we know we probably make now, but we don't know when or where, is misidentifying somebody who's fully conscious for completely unconscious. Unfortunately, we've, we're at a period of time now where we know that we can make that error, but we don't actually have a safety net. I think that's going to make a huge impact, and it's going to require a, a, a major shift of frame of how people think about this recovery process. However, there are precedents for this, and probably the best precedent for this is what the anesthesiologists deal with every day because they worry primarily about somebody waking up during anesthesia when they don't know it, okay? We're seeing the same problem in slow motion, and we now know where we may be missing it, but we don't know when and where. So that's one thing. The other thing I think that we're gonna to start to see in five years is a more systematic way of introducing medications that might help aid, speed the recovery process. And I think that process, uh, that, that, that impact will probably begin over the next several years, but just get started. And of course, what we hope is that some of the tools that we've been trying to work with, which are very experimental, the deep brain stimulation work, will mature over this period of time, although I don't know that in five years uh, that will be enough time to see it uh, in more general clinical use. There aren't too many places in the world where you can do cutting edge medical research in a field that requires a large population base. While Cornell is a top tier academic medical center in a city which has one of the largest populations in the world and the highest concentration of neuroscientists and people doing work that would make sense for me to collaborate with, there, there are a few other places in the world. I've been here for a long time and one of the unique things about the environment here compared to other places that I think have comparable pools of patients and skilled uh, professionals to work with is that as a physician scientist, this environment is unique. It's very compact, and to move between the bedside into the laboratories is very easy. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of cross-fertilization between basic scientists and clinicians who, usually because they've evolved their relationships over long periods of time, have the ability to really do translational work. I found this to be a conducive environment for my translational science and a fairly unique one. And, and while Cornell is, of course, situated in this tri-institutional uh, enclave, which pretty much makes it about the best place to do science, uh, you know, save maybe one or two other places in the entire globe. So I, I'm, I think that there are a lot of reasons that while Cornell stands out, but as a translational science center, it has enormous impact and enormous opportunity.